Hi, this is Daniel Karapkin speaking to you from the webyeshiva.org platform and on Facebook Live. Um, we are studying Morena Vuchim, Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed. Today, we are going to be covering chapter four in the second section of Morena Vuchim. And if you'd like to follow along in the Shlomo Pines edition, which is what we've been using for this whole time, uh, it is on page 255 in the Pines edition in the English. Um, let us uh, first get our bearings um, and find out where we are in this Morena Vuchim. The Rambam had told us, he had promised us at the very outset of the second section that he was going to be using Aristotle's philosophy and science as a means of explaining reality of all of metaphysics and physics, of all of the uh, things that exist in both the celestial realm and in the earthly realm as well. Um, the uh, celestial realm or the heavenly realm uh, for Aristotle is quite different, is made up of a completely different type of matter uh, than what is uh, what comprises and makes up uh, the elements of our world and the things that we find in our world, including living creatures and beings. And so uh, the Rambam feels that in order to um, properly explain how our world works, how the universe functions, he needs to first educate us and provide us with an exposition on Aristotelian science. Uh, the part that he said he's going to start first, um, because this is really necessary to discuss uh, God's existence and his association uh, with our world and his unitary nature and his incorporeality, the Rambam feels just as uh, in, in, in a way of sort of emulating Aristotle, he needs to start with the metaphysics and explain to us the heavenly realm. Now, it is important to note that um, in chapter three, which was just a very short chapter that we looked at, we spent maybe five minutes on it last week. That's really probably because it's really almost like a one statement in a, in a chapter, is that the Rambam wanted to make us aware of the fact that Aristotle conjectured and came up with plausible theories of the function of the heavenly realm. Since no one has actually been up there and no one has been able to measure certain things that are going on up there, uh, other than through the observation of the motion of the stars and the other planetary bodies, there's no way to be sure that Aristotle got everything right. Um, and therefore the Rambam is foreshadowing for us, he's signaling to us that there will be some give, there will be some elasticity in how we, um, um, how to what degree we remain faithful to the Aristotelian model. Um, and as we've presented over the last few weeks, the function of this or the benefit of this kind of exercise is not because we are suggesting that we go back to Aristotelian science and astronomy, uh, because modern science teaches us that Aristotle's conception of the way these, the heavens work was completely inaccurate. But it's rather to appreciate the fact that the project that the Rambam has, has engaged in is a project that he feels that is worthy because it helps to enhance and inform the way we understand God the way we understand the universe, and ultimately the way we can use our minds to better connect with the Ribbono Shalom, the master of the universe. Th using that kind of project, we can uh, oftentimes find ourselves transferring the Rambam's project with Aristotelianism to uh, a modern project of taking modern science and attaching it to our knowledge and informing our knowledge of Torah um, and being able to uh, be closer to God because we understand his universe better. So with that, the Rambam had told us in chapter three, I first need to uh, explain to you uh, very clearly what Aristotle maintains, and then we'll be able to use that information to show you how the Torah views the connection between God, the heavens, and man. So that's where we are, and if you'll just give me a moment, because it is a bit of a lengthy chapter, chapter four, we're going to cover it all today. I would like to be able to show you the outline. There really, I've divided this chapter into sort of 10 major points, with the final point being this uh, point number 11 being the synopsis that the Rambam provides, and I'll give it to you verbatim.
And uh, hopefully we'll be able to cover that in an efficient way. So I'm just going to bring up that screen in just a moment. Um, and here we are, I hope you can see it. Um, so the, um, the, the title that I've given to this chapter is Aristotle on the Motion of the Heavenly Spheres. And so the question that Aristotle deals with is, what causes the motion of a heavenly sphere? The Rambam maintains that there must be something that animates the sphere. Now, it's working under the premise that anytime something moves, it's either because of a force that is external. So, for example, if, if you see a rock flying through the air, you know that it's not the rock that is animated to fly, but rather the rock was thrown by someone or something. Okay, so the other alternative is that there's something that animates the object that you see in motion. And the Rambam concludes that if we see the heavenly spheres move, then it must be, and remember the term sphere means these concentric transparent spheres that Aristotle maintains based on the Ptolemaic uh, model of the universe. Aristotle maintained that these spheres are in constant motion. And we must conclude that there's that the spheres themselves are animated. They must have a soul that animates them just like a soul animates an animal or a soul animates a human being to move. In contrast to being moved forcefully by nature or rules of physics. Now the proof of this is that, um, and, and I guess before I go any further, I just wanted to share with you at the very last page of this handout, and you can always download these handouts by going to the Facebook group Shi'ur in Moren Avuchim, and I encourage you to become a member of that group and get regular updates. Um, uh, or you can go to the course description on webyeshiva.org. If you look on page three, I found the, a, a, a lovely uh, synopsis of Aristotelian physics on this blog before newton.blog. And some of the things that he writes are almost verbatim out of the way that the Rambam explains Aristotelian uh, rules th that we're going through now. So how can I prove to you that the sphere is not being moved externally or based on physics, but rather has a soul that animates it? And the proof is, goes like this, something which moves by virtue of its nature or the laws of physics usually moves in a straight path. What Pines translates as rectilinear or a straight path, either going up, down, or something like that. Furthermore, once it has reached its natural state, it comes to a stop. For example, a rock which has been thrown into the air will move by virtue of the laws of gravity downward. Once the rock reaches its natural place of being at a low point on the ground, it stops. The, gra the rock does not bore into the ground. Uh, another example is fire or heat by nature rises. Once it comes to its natural place of being in as high of a place as it can possibly reach, it stops moving. So what you expect from something that moves by virtue of its nature or by virtue of the fact that it needs to move because it has been caused to move by science or by, uh, or by its nature is that eventually when it comes to its natural place of rest, it comes to a rest. The sphere, however, that exists in the heavens moves in a circular motion and does so perpetually. So it does not move in a straight line, it moves in a circular way. Furthermore, it never comes to a stop. And those two factors indicate to the Rambam that it must have a soul, something within it that animates it and allows it to move. Point number two, but just because something is animated or has a soul does not fully explain why it moves. That's not the sole explanation. Just because I can move doesn't mean that I must move. And because even a being with a soul must be motivated to move for some reason, for some reason, either because it gravitates towards something that it desires or because it flees from something that it wishes to avoid. An animal will normally be stationary unless it needs to move in order to acquire food 
or it needs to run away from a predator. It makes no difference whether that motivation is real in the external or simply imagined in the mind of the being with a soul. So for example, an animal may run because it fears an actual predator or because it thinks it heard a noise and it thinks that it's a predator, right? So it doesn't make a difference whether that's real or imagined, but there must be something which motivates the being with a soul to move. The sphere, however, does not move because it is running toward or away from anything. How do I know that? Because, first of all, it's moving in a circular motion, which means it keeps returning to the same point where it departed from. So it can't be running away from anything if it keeps coming back to the same point, nor is it moving towards something outside of where it currently resides in order to acquire something that it currently doesn't have. And so therefore we must conclude that the circular nature of the heavenly sphere's motion is neither to acquire nor to flee from. If the sphere, if the sphere were moving in order to reach or avoid something, it would eventually come to a rest just like anything else which moves for that reason. And that's the reason why an animal is not running perpetually. It runs until it finds what it's looking for or until it feels safe in fleeing from its predator. Um, but the sphere is in constant motion. It never comes to a rest. If its movement is perpetual because it can never properly attain its goal or properly run away from that which it seeks to avoid, then its motion would be futile and it would not move at all. And therefore, any kind of movement that is for the sake of serving the being that is moving uh, must eventually come to an end and must go from point A to point B. But because the motion of the celestial sphere uh, is in a constant circular motion, it's not going toward or away from anything in particular, and it's, and it's uh, perpetual, that indicates that it's not moving in the way that a normal being with a soul moves. So what's the conclusion leads us to point number three. We must therefore conclude that there is a more sophisticated mental representation within the sphere that causes it to move. It's not purely just like an instinct that an animal has to move away from or towards something that it needs, but rather the sphere is endowed with some kind of intelligence. This forces us to conclude that every sphere is endowed with not only a soul which animates it, but also an intellect which endows it with mental representations. And I use the word sophisticated because that just helps me understand the distinction. The distinction between an animal and a human being is that an animal will run towards or away from things that are purely for immediate utility. A human being will be in motion for a number of different reasons. I may not have a particular benefit in moving uh, towards uh, picking up a book or something like that, because I don't necessarily need the book for my survival. But if I wish to enrich myself in some way, to become more ennobled, to become more enlightened, I may move for those reasons, which are not therefore for the purpose of uh, gaining something that is more animalistic. So it's not just an animating soul, but there must be an intelligence that is contained within each and every sphere. But that's still not sufficient reason to explain the motion of the heavenly sphere. This is point number four, since many beings are endowed with intellect and soul and still don't move by virtue of their mental representations. The additional ingredient that a being of intellect needs is desire. There has to be some kind of desire that a, an intelligent being needs in order to motivate it to move. And therefore the Rambam, or, so Aristotle, because the Rambam is really citing Aristotle here, each heavenly sphere possesses three qualities, three sort of innate qualities. Number one, a soul which animates it. Number two, an intellect, which provides it with mental representations. And number three, desire which causes it to move in order to fulfill its desire. But what indeed is that desire? What is it that the sphere desires in order to cause it to move? Now, I just want to just take a, um, an interlude right here, lest you, lest you be so concerned that this is so way off base uh, 
that we are endowing celestial bodies with intelligence. Um, just recall the Psalms. Hashamayim esaprim kavod kel umaasei adav magid harakia yom liyom yabia omer belaila lelaila yichaved daat. The uh, psalmist in in the book of Tehillim is filled with expressions of how the heavens uh, speak to and express their great desire for the Creator. So uh, just just keep that in mind for just a moment. And even though the science is off. Nonetheless, the I, the concept itself of there being a sentience uh, and an intelligence and a desire within the heavenly bodies should not be so foreign to us. We who are uh, biblically based in the way that we understand the depiction of the heavens. What is the nature of that desire that causes the sphere to move? And this is point number five. It is the sphere's desire to be like God. That's That's really sort of the punchline of Aristotle is that the sphere is in constant motion because the spheres have a desire as a as something that emanates from the prime mover the supreme being to emulate that supreme being now remember aristotle will not call this being god aristotle will call it the deity or the prime mover or the prime cause but uh, but we can call it god because the rambam is using aristotle as a way of explaining where he wants to explain us a, a Torah concept. God is static and constantly active. And this is represented by this incessant motion that is circular. Circular motion suggests not changing or moving from one state to another. If I'm constantly remaining in the same orbit, that means I'm not changing or shifting places. I'm constantly moving in one localized area. I am remaining in the same state, and that's why Aristotle felt that circular motion represents perfection. We alluded to this before, and you can read more about that in the in the article that I cite on page three of this handout. But that's what Aristotle essentially believed. Circular motion also suggests a constant overflowing of goodness, and the reason for that is because uh, the prime cause, the the, the supreme being, uh, emanates from itself uh, a constant flow of what the Rambam calls goodness, and that flows to the rest of the universe. And these spheres, which are the recipients of that goodness, wish to as well spin off, if you will, that goodness onto beings that are lower than themselves. And just to quote the way the, the Pines translation, for this is the final perfection of what is possible for a body, to have as its perpetual activity, for it is the simplest of motions that a body may have, this circular motion. And no change occurs because of it in the essence of the body or in the overflow of good effects resulting necessarily from the motion of the body. And so therefore, it seems that in order to emulate God, you cannot just be stationary because God is constantly active. God is described as an active being, the ultimately active being. In order, activity is represented by motion. But that motion does not represent a change essentially in the being who is moving, and that's represented by its circularity of motion. And finally, the, the motion represents that something is emanating from me as a result of motion, that through motion, I emanate down to those beings or existence which can receive some of the benefit of this motion. And as we'll see, the universe is comprised of concentric heavenly spheres, and each higher sphere emanates something through its motion down to the sphere below it. So after concluding the above through philosophic speculation, this is point number six, this is all based on philosophic speculation. In other words, we want to make it clear. This is all the theory part of Aristotle. This is not through observation of the stars. This is based on what Aristotle thought in his mind made the most sense. And from this point forward, Aristotle now demonstrated through observation that the spheres must be moving in different paths and at different speeds. He, he concluded, um, based on the fact that if you look at the motion of the stars and the other heavenly bodies, you see that they're moving at different speeds, different velocities, and different directions. 
So there must be multiple spheres where these heavenly bodies are embedded in, but each sphere is moving at a slightly different pace, velocity, direction, and so forth. He thus concluded that each sphere possesses its own unique intellect, different from the intellects of the other spheres. Each intellect moves its sphere. Um, so that's what, that's what Aristotle concludes, that because each sphere contains its own intellect, which motivates it to have this desire to want to emulate God, each sphere's intellect is slightly different, because if one is moving one way and the other sphere is moving another way, it must be that each one has a different intellect that is spurring it to, it, its, its movement. Now, originally, based on observation alone, Aristotle concluded, looking at all the different types of motion, that there were 50 spheres and 50 corresponding intellects. This was before knowledge of mathematics was perfected, however, says the Rambam, which now allows us, modern mathematics allows us to reconcile multiple motions and velocities within one sphere. And therefore, the philosophers of the medieval period who came centuries after Aristotle and are living in the Rambam's time or before the Rambam, came to the conclusion, and these are mostly Islamic philosophers who took Aristotelian writings and distilled them and refined them, came to the conclusion that there are only 10 spheres. And these 10 spheres are in accord with the way that our sages record the different planetary bodies. They are the outer sphere closest to God. The, the second of the, of the 10 is the sphere of the stars, that sphere which controls the motion of all of the different stars that we see every night in a slightly different place. And then the last seven, or um, which is um, going to be um, uh, the, 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 that come after the first two are the seven planets. They're known as seven planets, even though in modern vernacular that not all of them are planets, but they are going from the outermost down to the innermost, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the sun, Venus, Mercury, and the moon. This is not explicit in the text of the Rambam, but that's what becomes clear from when you look at the original writings in Aristotle. Each sphere possesses its own intellect, and below all the spheres that we've just enumerated, these nine, is a tenth intellect in the lowermost sphere known as the active intellect. The active intellect is responsible. Now, we've spoken a little bit about the active intellect in previous um, sessions of Morena Vuchim. It is a very foreign concept to anyone who has not studied, um, um, I, I guess what you would call Neoplatonic Neo Aristotelian philosophy. It is a very nebulous concept, even within uh, philosophical writings. If one is interested in learning more about the active intellect, there was a, a an excellent book written by Professor Herbert Davidson of Blessed Memory, who just recently passed away, um, who uh, was uh, an Orthodox Jew, but who was able to had a mastery of uh, Arabic Islamic philosophy, and wrote a significant amount trying to distill and explain this concept of the active intellect using Al-Farabi and Avicenna primarily to demonstrate, and Averroes, to demonstrate what this active intellect is, essentially to sort of bring it to its uh, simplest definition. The active intellect is pure intellect that exists in heaven. It is um, a source of knowledge, and it provides form, because Aristotle argues that everything in the physical world is comprised of form and matter, it is the intelligence that provides form to all different shapes and, and, uh, and things that, that are of bodily substance that exist in our world. And we know that, for example, uh, for Aristotle, if a carpenter builds a chair, the, ma the, the, the matter of the chair is the wood. But where did the chair get its form, its, its chairness, the form of the chair? That came from the carpenter's mind. So using that analogy, everything that is physical that exists in the world, if it's not man-made, where did it get its form from? And that comes from the mind or the intellect of the active intelligence. So that's one function of the active intellect. 
But there's another function of the active intellect because Aristotle describes this idea of overflow, that the supreme being, the supreme deity, overflows from itself and passes on intelligence to the sphere, the outermost sphere. That outermost sphere passes on some of God's intelligence to the sphere below it, and so on and so forth, until this emanation, this overflow, arrives at the lowermost sphere, which contains the active intellect. That active intellect contains intelligence or ideas or knowledge. And human beings have what's called potential intellect, where we have a mind which we develop and we work on, and we try to bring our mind to its most perfected state through education and the acquisition of knowledge. But at some point, we receive some of our knowledge as an overflow from the active intellect, where we sort of tap into almost like a source of energy, of knowledge, like knowledge energy that overflows from the active intellect into the human mind. It's what we would call sometimes when you have a eureka moment and you have an epiphany of knowledge, that knowledge was believed by Aristotelian philosophers to be coming from the active intellect. And so point number eight is the active intellect is responsible for, for bringing that which is in a state of potential, potentiality into, actu into actuality in our world. So premise number 18 of the 26 premises that were contained in the introduction to section two had stated that anything that changes from potential to actual is changed from without. And so the example that we just described is the carpenter. Here, the Rambam uses the example of building a shed. Uh, the carpenter builds a shed from wood based on the form of a shed that exists in his mind. This form causes the shed to change from its potential state of planks of wood into its actual state of a shed. Anything possessing form must therefore have something outside of itself that granted it this form. The mind of the carpenter received the form in his mind itself. You know, where did he get that thing in his mind that it, uh, the shape of a shed? He, ex ex he acquired that from an external intellect, just like anything that has form in our world received its form from an external intellect. So, uh, so point number nine is just as every being and thing in our world possessing form is acted upon by the active intellect, so is every sphere in the heavens acted upon by a separate intellect from its own. So after the Rambam had gotten through explaining us that every sphere has its own intelligence that causes it to desire and want to move, but it's also acted upon by a separate intelligence that is external to itself. What is that external intelligence? This separate intellect is that of the sphere immediately above it or outside of it. And thus every human being that is influenced by the active intellect is akin to a heavenly sphere, is analogous to a heavenly sphere, receiving its influence from the sphere immediately above it. So therefore, what, what, what is being depicted here is an emanation of intellect or knowledge or, or just brain power, whatever you want to call it. It's, we call it intellect in philosophical jargon. There is a constant flowing downward from God down to the outermost sphere, down to the sphere below it, all of, of this energy of intellect. And ultimately, human beings acquire their intellect from this overflow of intellect energy and then until it reaches into our minds. And that's the function of what we call the active intellect. As we'll learn as we go along in the writings of the Rambam and in other philosophical writings, it doesn't happen automatically. A person needs to take initiative with his own mind to activate his mind to the best of his ability so that it is primed to receive this overflow of knowledge. If a person never bothers to study carpentry, for example, he will not be, his mind will not be filled with the form of a shed with which to build it. He's gotta be able to work on some modicum of knowledge acquisition on his own before he receives that influence from the active intellect. Okay, this is just a very cursory introduction. Finally, point number 10 is that God is the ultimate mover of the first intellect that is contained um, on the, the outermost reaches where God resides. This intellect is the cause of the movement of the outermost sphere, 
and through this movement, everything else in this world is moved. Thus, God's effect on this world is indirect through a chain of causalities starting from himself to the outermost spheres, down the chain of lower spheres, and finally via the active intellect. God therefore burns through fire, for example, but indirectly, in that the fire is moved by the motion of the lowest sphere, and that sphere is moved in turn by a separate intellect going all the way up the chain. These intellects in our Torah language are called angels. The angels are depicted as being close to God because they reside in the heavenly realm moving the spheres. And refer back uh, to premise number 16 in the introduction to, uh, to, uh, to section two, which was that a thing which is not a body cannot be perceived in terms of quantity that is more than one, unless they are things which are noted as causes and effects, namely different levels of angels. And that would account for, even though the heavenly spheres are not bodies, and therefore there should not be known in terms of quantity, but since there is a, a, a sense of causality from one sphere to another, they can be disparate and distinct from each other, even though they are not bodies. Okay, and God is separate from even the highest intellect, that which moves the outermost sphere, and thus God is the prime mover of all and the only necessary existent being. And to just conclude this, we read from the Rambam's last lines of this chapter, all his, meaning all of Aristotle's disquisition, disquisition meaning all, all of his um, expounding on this principle of how the celestial spheres move may be summed up as follows. All spheres are living bodies endowed with a soul and an intellect, having a mental representation of their own first principles, meaning ultimately of God, and that is what causes them to have this desire to move. In that which exists, there are separate intellects that are in no way a body. All of them overflow from God, and they are intermediaries between God and the bodies of our world. And so that is the way that the Rambam sort of sums up this whole idea of the motion of the celestial spheres. Now, why is this exercise beneficial for us? So the Rambam concludes the chapter by saying, and this is the very last two lines of the chapter on page 259, I now shall explain to you in the following chapters what in our law, what in our Torah corresponds to these opinions and what in it differs from them. So remember, the Rambam introduced to us in chapter three as well, when these are theories of Aristotle, we will be able to align so much of what the Torah says about the heavens with the way that Aristotle depicted, but there will come times where we will have to depart. And now we're gonna carefully sort of filter and refine this process in the ensuing chapters. So today was purely Aristotelian. There was very little uh, Torah language in our discussion today because chapter four of the, the second section of Moran Abuchim was dedicated to explaining Aristotle. I'm not sure if you fulfilled your mitzvah of Talmud Torah from our study of this chapter today, um, but that's just an aside. We're going to hold it here for now, and let me wish you all a wonderful uh, rest of the week, and we'll see you next time, God willing.